Music. Now we're paused. Hello, and welcome to Student Affairs Live, my uh, the weekly love show dedicated to all things student affair and in the student affairs field in higher ed. Um, we're part of the Higher Education Network, along with Admissions Live and hosted by Ashley Hennigan. Our network is dedicated to digital development and professional empowerment. I'm your host, not Ed Cabell, and I'm Mike Hamilton. <laughs> um, reading an old script, also. Uh, coming to you from my professional home, WPI, um, my much more cluttered office than maybe Joe is in currently, but um, yeah. <laughs> today's show is going to be a little bit different. Um, Ed can't be here today. He's doing some a lot of stuff on the Bridgewater State campus. Um, I believe he's interviewing. I just saw someone post that they're interviewing like a boss with him, so that sounds fun. Um, but today we are going to make it happen. Um, Joe and Lisa, who um, just decided to be here very last minute, um, as of yesterday at about 10 a.m., um, are, are kind of my experts in the let's get some conversation started. Um, <laughs> so I thought they'd be good guests. We're going to bring them on. We're going to talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about. Um, I'm going to try to follow the feed as we're going. So post your questions. We want to hear from you. We want to go in whatever direction that you want to. And um, in the spirit of something that's happening this week, if you didn't know, um, tomorrow is the second, I guess, annual BU CONFAB um, hosted by uh, Dean Ken Elmore. Um, it's kind of a week of let's talk about some topics, let's get some things out there, let's not do the conventional style. Um, you've seen the unconference posts, you know that Ed works with that. Um, it's something I love. It, it's kind of off the books. Let's just go open session on this and see where it goes. Um, yeah, so starting off, let's get a little introductions. Uh, Lisa, from the great province of Canada, I guess. Oh, talk? oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> <That's a little. laughs> talk to us a little bit about yourself, you know, where you're coming from, why your um, name has a web address that has a .ca after it. We talk about everything in general. <laughs> sure. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome uh, to the sunny shores of Canada, the country of Canada. Uh, I currently work at the University of Ontario Institute of Technology. My work uh, spans almost anything and everything related to student affairs. I started here in career services, which was a complete 180 of what I've been doing in the past. Um, and now my work really focuses on storytelling. I spend a lot of time helping students tell their stories and helping staff figure out how to best help students tell those stories. Uh, so a lot of my work right now focuses on assessment, so that's anything from learning outcomes to figuring out how we're going to assess those learning outcomes to anywhere in between of trying to make up uh, programming that helps students achieve the outcomes we've set out for them. Um, some of that work also goes into leadership development programming, as much as I'm loath to talk about leadership in a very general sense, and I think that term doesn't always resonate with our students, we do talk about skill development, um, and we do talk about how those skills can help students write their stories and perhaps um, help them walk some of the path they're creating and we're creating with them. Um, and I also do work on the first year student transition, which I know Joe does too, so a lot of helping our students transition into the university. But we're also focusing on helping students transition out again. Um, we certainly don't want to see the university as a bubble or see the university as um, thing outside of the work that students are doing to develop and grow um, outside these four walls. So we're really looking at the university as a um, a part of, not a separate piece of their identity and their experience. That help? A. Translation: Lisa has at least a four-page resume and served. Yeah. Um, Joe, talk to us about you. Can you make it go on as well? Yeah, as I could try. So right now I'm at the Borough of Manhattan Community College. Like Lisa said, I'm working with new and first-year students, uh, trying to create some new orientation programs here, mix things up a little bit to deal with um, the community college incoming students. Uh, very, very diverse group of students from all ages, lengths. So the typical icebreaker, here we go, rah, rah thing doesn't work here. So it's um, a little bit changed from what I've used to be working on, and it's a great challenge and enjoying that end of it. Aside from that, you know me, I'm trying to stir up conversations and, and start new ideas and push Conference 30 and, and kind of, you know, Conference 3.0 with Kristen Abel and a few other things. Um, you know, try and keep conversation going and keep people interested and Make sure they're on their toes, and if I annoy people, all the better. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Um, 
I you said icebreakers. I, I got to go there. I'm sorry. Um, go for it. We've we've I think all three of us we've been in the field for a little while, um, and and we did the leadership thing before getting into the field, so we've been doing them for a while. <laughs> Are there any that you just are tired of at this point? I, I said we'll go anywhere with the show. I want to know. I, I personally, I said it to you guys beforehand, I'm tired of two truths and a lie. I know that it's always going to happen to all my OL friends out there. Much love. I was an OL. I use it every session, but um, I just can't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you, what, what, the, what, what icebreakers are you staying away from? And have you supplemented anything? Team builders, icebreakers, whatever you want. I'll, I'll say... And here, here's my thing: being an orientation and being that person who used to love running icebreakers. And here we go. Let's, you know, how do you move? I'm Joe, and I move like this, and all that craziness. You know what? If we took orientation and took time to show students how to appropriately introduce themselves to a group of people who are going to be around them, maybe it'd be better. So they're not walking into conferences and walking into, you know, networking opportunities, saying, "Hey, how you doing? I'm Juvenile Joe. How can I help you?" Like, coming up with all these different ways. Why not be able to come up to somebody and say, "All right, folks, we're sitting in a circle." Let's figure out how to introduce each other to each other like adults. <laughs> yeah, I think mine, I don't know if you if you call it this in the States, but we use um, the big wind blows all the time, which drove me nuts. Big wind blows and anybody who's wearing red and everyone goes in the middle of the circle and high fives. And I have nothing against high fives. We all know I'm an advocate for high fives. Um, but one, it presupposes that everyone can and will move around. So anything that involves movement um, has always been tricky for me. Um, and secondly, the notion of trying to find sameness and trying to put everybody in the same um, category is difficult when we try to make such gross generalizations right off the bat with our students. Yes, they are all our first year students and they have a common experience, but they'll go through that common experience in very different ways. So we jump very quickly to putting everybody together in a common space and trying to find the similarities when really we should be celebrating the differences, which I understand is really hard to do with icebreakers because you want to find that commonality to connect people with each other. But like Joe was saying, it's those differences that will allow us to introduce each other like adults, right? We can have those chances to say, you know, I came from Canada and you came from the States and what makes us different and what makes us the same or, you know, what makes us better, like our Tim Hortons coffee, but... <laughs> um. So clearly I am not introducing myself correctly, so I will stick with that. Um, I am no longer motivated, Mike. Um, <laughs> you guys both work in first. Oh, no. <laughs> you're now still you're... going to be Canadian Lisa, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> that's all I'm known for. <laughs> and all of the amazing things that you do. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, you guys both work in first-year programs or have stuff to do with first-year programs, um, and you've been doing it for a little while. Let me, let me ask you this. What... What is different about the first year student now? This, you know, now from when you started working with you know that population, what have you seen differently? And I know we all talk, you know, we generalize. We talk about millennials. We talk about what the next generation is going to be. Um, but what are those little things? What What do you see differently with those students, you know, on a day to day basis that they're not, you know, that's different about when they when you first started working with them? There's really no such thing as the traditional student anymore. And it's just as exciting as it is frightening um, that there's no such thing as the traditional student anymore. And that really was clear to me when I started working here. I was working with education. Um, and here in Ontario, students have to complete a one-year B.Ed. Bachelor's of Education program um, before they can be certified as a teacher to teach in the province. And the students that I was working with doing resume work, cover letter work, their resumes were more impressive than mine and had longer histories than mine. I remember helping... Um, an older woman who had been an engineer for a number of years and I looked at her resume and she had built or helped design a car that had transported one of our prime ministers and I'm sitting there as a 20 something new professional trying to help at her resume going I've done nothing with my life I have no idea how to help you um, so really recognizing more than ever that these students are coming from such unique and such varied backgrounds and they bring that with them um, to the university. And very often with our first year students, we run the risk of generalizing like you were saying, Mike, but we also run the risk of assuming um, that they're more or less a blank slate when they get here. So when we do the icebreakers, when we do the orientation activities, we assume and we generalize that they've never done this stuff before, that they've never introduced themselves to anyone before, that they've never done skill development before, that they've never used the skills we're trying to develop. So. We come from this generalized empty vessel place, um, and that's really not uh, not working <laughs> anymore. Um, these students could probably teach circles around me in some cases, but we're not giving them the opportunity to. 
I think I think the surprise is gone, right? You can't go to a new student orientation like I did and not know who's going to be in your circle and not know who's going to be there. Now you can do it all online. Hey, I got I mean, look at the and it's a great thing. Look at the stuff that um TJ Logan's doing at University of Florida. The, those students, as soon as they got their letter of acceptance, they're already part of something bigger than themselves, and they're able to communicate that and, sh and connect with everybody else who's doing it. So I think that that level of surprise and genuine curiosity when you walk onto a campus for an orientation program or as a new student is gone because you're now able to walk onto campus so prepared if you've done your homework and if you've reached out to all the opportunities that offices are putting together through Facebook groups or Twitter campaigns or Instagrams or all these different things, Hangouts, for instance, um, I think a little bit of nostalgia for me. That you know, sometimes it's good to just go into a place where you you have no idea what's going on and you have to ask for help. But now it's people already kind of sketched out who their roommates are and who who's going to be in their hall and where they're living and who's in their classroom. It's just kind of it's the new world, and I think it's the way we got to adjust how we teach that and how we still help these students regardless of age or where they're coming from to have that sense of curiosity about people because now that I think that's kind of going away. Awesome. I, I know for me personally, I think I tried, I, and kind of goes with what both of you are saying, I'm trying to give them more credit. Um, I think that they have, um, you know, you come in and you hear certain things and you, you, know, you generalize, you put them into certain groups, but then once you start working with them, you see that there's, there, you know, when you work with them on an individual basis, there's so much more that they are capable of um, than just, you know, just a generic label that we're putting on them, um, especially when it comes to technology. I mean, I, I, I work with professionals and show them technology all the time, but um, the students, I mean, they, they show me things. You know, they're teaching me things constantly. I mean, I do work at a technolo technology-based school, but... Um, I'm assuming it's the same kind of on your campuses. These students are very advanced. Um, they, they come in knowing a lot more than we do, and they're going to, you know, it's, it's going to continue happening. So I guess to, to, to round out this first year, the first year student question I have, um, how far do you, like, what, do you see there being a generation past, like, a, a group generation past millennials, and when do you see that happening? Like, when do you see the next book coming out about this is what the this is what the this is what the generation is going to be? And you know, do you see do you see that happening anytime soon? Do you see a next fad coming? Hmm. No, not, I didn't prep you with any of these questions, so <laughs> um, I you know I'm, I'm if, you, if you don't have the answer, that's that's okay because I don't have the answer. But I'm just throwing it out there for thoughts. I hope I hope the next fad, and it, it depends a lot on K through. K through 12, and it depends a lot on what uh, you know higher ed institutions are planning. But I hope the next fad of students are aware of what their digital identity is and what it means, and have that established before they walk onto campus. So they're not, you know, they're thinking already of the image that they're putting out there. Because, like I said, there's no surprise. I can Google who you are and find out what you do before I even meet you in person. Um, I think the other thing is, again, with, with K through 12, I hope the next generation of students is a generation of builders. Are people who have that entrepreneurial thinking not necessarily I'm gonna go into business but maybe I'm gonna just do something more than what everybody else is doing like I'm gonna you know lemonade stands or I'm gonna go volunteer more I'm gonna go pursue you know an Eagle Scout badge or something along those lines something that's more than I'm gonna show up to class do service because the resume and all my college counselors tell me I need to do service to get into a school and I'm gonna do a part-time job so it shows that I have work ethic why not go further than that why not try and make a difference in your community that's what I hope the next generation is I hope the next generation walks into a campus and says hey I'm here to learn from you and share what I've learned and here's actually what I've already done now how can you as a campus make sure that I can keep this going and make it bigger than what it is now and, and to build on what, what Joe was saying, actually the word that kept going through in my head was architect um, and have students be the architect of their own experiences. We're already starting to see students who are much more assertive about constructing their experience and will no longer identify with that empty vessel model. So it's not students being passive in course selection or in experiences they choose or what they do in those experiences. We offer experiences and we offer opportunities, but again, going back to my earlier point, these students, and as Joe was saying, are already coming in with experiences and continue to have other experiences while they're here. And they're growing and, and developing in those roles whether we give them opportunities or not. Um, I said a while ago that we are not the only game in town anymore and we are competing, frankly, competing with other opportunities for learning that aren't in this structured um, university college experience. So our students are coming in um, in a way as consumers, though I hesitate to use that term, but they're very much coming in wanting to be the architects of their own experience and they're coming to us to look for things that we haven't built yet. 
um, things that they want to build with us, which is really cool, but again, really frightening because there's certainly an established status quo to what we do and how we do it, and now students are coming in wanting to play a part in it, and I don't know yet if we're ready for that. See everyone, I can ask any question, and they're going to come up with some sort of an answer. That's the goal of today. <laughs> ask That's <a> education. <laughs> ask a question on the SA Live hashtag. Uh, tweet it to at higher ed live or tweet it to me um, and we'll get your question on there and they will come up with some sort of an answer because that's what Joe and Lisa are. It, it's Ask Joe and Lisa Day on our unsession of SA Live <laughs> and I do have my first question. So we're going we're gonna to switch gears completely. Okay. Brian Bork, he wants to know what do grad, well I guess it's kind of tied. What do grad prep program faculty need to do to help prepare essay grads um, to become the essay pro for today and tomorrow's student? That's a good question, Brian. Um, to be honest, I would say get out of the way. <laughs> get out of the way. Um, and going back to my original point, in, in Canada, we don't have traditional um, graduate prep programs for student affairs. We have masters of education programs, we have masters in higher ed, but we don't have anything around college student personnel that I know a lot of my states have done. We just don't have that. It doesn't exist. Um, so I've had to piecemeal my education and my qualifications to get to a position like this. I do have a master's in education, but I also have experience working in colleges and universities or experience working in the not-for-profit volunteer sector. Um, so. Part of it really is bringing in those experiences and those lessons that I've learned and allowing me and others in those graduate programs to talk through those experiences and about how they relate to the students we're going to be working with. Um, so in a way, it's, it's not just modeling the way, but creating it, if you will, and allowing students the opportunity to um, develop the tools for them to be able to do that and for us to teach what that might look like. Get out of the way. <laughs> I think going off of what Lisa had mentioned earlier is get them comfortable telling their story. Get them comfortable sharing who they are, marketing who they are. I mean, we can get into this later, but I'm having lots of great side conversations about this, this notion of humble brags. Really? Is this where we're at right now as educators? Hey, I think I did well, but I need to be validated. So someone, can you please, this is a humble brag. Like, come on. And you're going to see some more of that come from me and a few other people in the field of, you know, blog posts. But I think you, we need to get these future professionals in education, in higher education, to be comfortable telling their story, sharing, you know, who they are, what their goals are, what they want to do, and being that role model for other students to be able to get up and say, all right, I'm a student. And here's what I'm going to accomplish, and here's what I want to do, and here's what my goals are. And I don't think we do that well enough. I think we mask it through, you know, themes of a conference and we have to tie the title to a theme and we have to have these learning outcomes. Yeah, that's great. Learning outcomes are great. But if we can't get students and faculty and staff to be able to stand up in front of a room and say, here's my story, here's who I am, what do we, I mean, that's not a dig at introverts. Introverts can do that through letters. Can, they can do it in a room as well. But to be able to be comfortable at first saying, sharing your story, I think that's, regardless what industry you're in, I think that needs to be your basic skill or one of your basic skills. It's good that you said that nothing is wrong with learning outcomes, Joe, I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Brian. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, great answers, guys. Um, some pre, keep, keep the questions coming. We want to know what you want to know. Um, ask away. Um, I'm going to move in. I'm going to direct this question toward Lisa. Uh, Lisa is famous on YouTube now. Um, <laughs> she participated in a TEDx event. Um, so I guess it was a university-based event, event, correct? Um, and what I, what I guess I want to ask is, um, I don't know how involved you were with behind the scenes. Um, so if you could go into kind of how that event came to happen, um, what the goals of that event were, um, what you know, what the other speakers on the list kind of talked about, mm -hmm. and then kind of go into what you talked about. Um, because I, I watched it today. You gave a great speech. You talked about some great things. You talked um, kind of about going to the Young Conference and <laughs> eating chocolate chip cookies. So, um, Full talk. I just give it to us. cookies for about 18 minutes. It was fantastic. <laughs> um, the, the, the TEDx talk is UTSC, and UTSC is my alma mater. It is where I did my undergrad. And basically, UTSC just wanted to do a TEDx event like many other universities in our area have done already. Um, the theme this year was Reorder the Ordinary, so of course I was all over that theme, and it's certainly something we're talking about today. Um, the other speakers really focused on 
in general, the same thing I talked about, really um, beyond reorder the ordinary, it was taking something that in a lot of cases is so ingrained in us that it's almost assumed. It's something that we talk about without even thinking. It's something we define in a way that um, other people define for us and we've just accepted it as fact. So for me, it was about teaching. For other people, it was about finance. Um, but overall, people took topics that we take for granted or even just words and terms we take for granted, positivity, uh, happiness, um, strengths was another really good talk. So what does it mean when we say we have a strength? And really turned that um, term or topic on its head and gave us an opportunity to think about it in a very different way. Um, so it was an entire day for me of getting as far outside my comfort zone as you can possibly imagine. So I loved it. Um, but also an opportunity to uh, borrow from, from Apple, and I hope we won't get sued, but to think differently, um, to give us a chance to um, think and, and speak and do and, and learn and teach in a way that was very different. Um, which segues into what I was talking about, which is really about teaching. Um, and speaking of the UnConference, when I went to the SA Tech Boston UnConference last year, the whole model is based around peer-to-peer -peer learning. The whole model is based around everyone sitting in the same place, literally in the same place, um, on the same level, literally on the same level, no stage to speak of. And there was a push and expectation uh, of and for peer-to-peer -peer learning. So everyone is supposed to come in on equal or somewhat equal footing and have something to share and something to talk about, something to teach. Um, but when I looked at the survey results, and you can see me talk about this in the talk, when I looked at the survey results, there was one particular question where we talked about peer-to-peer -peer learning, and everyone was talking about peer-to-peer -peer learning from a consumption model. Everyone was talking about, I came here to get something. I wanted something. Give me something. Um, and I pulled out some of those words in the assessment nerd that I am. I did a qualitative analysis, and I looked at all the responses, and I found all of these words that were very possessive and consumption focused. Give me something. Uh, and that fascinated me that we had all come in. Peer-to-peer -peer learning is awesome. I mean, the unconference had a fantastic response. The SA Tech unconferences that um, Ed has helped organize that are going out, rolling out um, across um, not just the U.S., but Canada as well um, in August. The whole notion is about peer-to-peer -peer learning. The whole notion is about talking and sharing with each other. But the assessment results were, no, give me something. I have nothing to give you. I just want to take. Um, and that absolutely fascinated me that we can, on the surface, be so excited about peer-to-peer -peer learning but come in with the expectation that someone else is going to teach and I'm going to learn. Um, so I spent just under 15 minutes. There's a countdown clock in front of you when you give a TED Talk that literally tells you second by second how much time you have to speak, which is frightening. Um, it was 14, 15. I, I spent some time disrupting the notion of teaching. Um, we talk about lifelong learning all the time, but we don't talk about lifelong teaching. And what that really means is we've normalized not knowing, but we haven't normalized knowing. It's very safe for us to talk about, I don't know something. We always tell our students, question everything. Always ask questions. It's OK that you don't know. You're here to learn. Um, lifelong learning is fantastic. I agree with all of those. But we're also not complementing the message with, you can also teach. You can also share. Like Joe was saying mm -hmm. something of value. When you introduce yourself, um, there is a history and there's experience behind that that is powerful and meaningful to somebody else. But if you don't share that, you'll never make that connection and you'll never make that impact. Um, so I was talking a lot about the idea of teaching and more so in this talk anyway, it was talking about how we put teaching up on a pedestal, but the higher up you go on the pedestal, the more distorted the image is to the point where you don't even know what you're looking for anymore. And what that means is no one can be a teacher because no one anymore knows what it means to teach. Awesome. <laughs> I to give a little... Version. Yeah, there you go. There's your applause. <laughs> um, I think, I think based around your topic, um, I think that brings us into a good category. Um, the the unconference, the the non-traditional. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of the show that this week is the second EU confab. Um, I know both of you guys were there last year, or you know looked into uh, looked into that. But te SA Tech Boston, the Big Ideas Conference, all of these things that have happened that are outside the normal confines of organizational conferences. Um, they're kind of put on by the community. I know I love them. I love them for my own reasons. But kind of share why, you know, what your thoughts are on those. What, you know, how can they be built upon? Are you hopeful that they're built upon? Um, and you know, what are you looking? For, you know, why why did you go in the first place? What are you looking forward to? Um, do you hope to go to one again? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Joe, you first. 
I mean, I, I'd love to be able to go to another one. I hope to have a, a SA Tech down in New York City and try and plan something around here. The reason why is I attended my first NASPA when I was a student, but as a professional, I attended as a grad student, I think, in 2006. Um, and you know what? Not much has changed. <laughs> you go to one NASPA, you've been to them all. Now, hopefully the model changes a little bit more, and hopefully, the, you know, going around to ballrooms and hearing people speak and then going to lectures and sitting and watching a screen and, you know, you know, you ask people why you go to NASPA, you ask people why you go to any conference, and the majority of people are going to say, oh, because I get to see people I haven't seen all year. This is, this is my chance to see everybody. Well, that's not really the point of bringing all the, you know, this knowledge community together and, and sharing knowledge. It's not about broadcasting what you know. It's a broadcasting of it's having a conversation about here's what I know and here's how it can affect you. Here's how you can put it into play. Talk to me. Let's have a conversation. Too many sessions are one way that you just leave with a pile full of stuff. And by the time you get back to campus, since you've been gone for four or five days, that stuff sits in a corner and then you're, you're busy doing your day-to-day -day stuff and a week or two goes by and you're still looking at that big pile and it's just like, nah, what now? So I think the, the, the thing with the young conferences, part of it is it's fresh, it's new. People are, are curious about it. People want to go to it. People, people are, are excited about the change or some people are excited about the change. Um, and I think it's necessary. I think it's necessary to have some competition. We can't just have two of the huge associations having their annual conferences like they've always had and then hope that these outside efforts start putting into something new that challenges them. And I know, I believe it has. I think, you know, certainly ACPA and NASPA has, has taken attention to big ideas or, or SA Tech and everything like that because they see if, if, if both organizations are going to sit there and brag saying we are our members, well, folks, your members are acting, doing things that they want you to do, but you're not doing it, so they're doing it themselves. So either that's great that you're, you're frustrating your members so much that they're getting action or it's sad that it's reached the point where they have to take the action that the association should be leading. See, I, I'm going to throw out that I, I worry about I, I worry about associations taking on these type of things because then comes an, an added cost and a profitability and all of, and all of that that comes with it. Yes, there's incre you know, an increased level of planning and people that have done it before. However, you know, when I can go to a, a conference for free or minimal money um, and sit in a room with 100 people that want to learn from each other, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's an awesome experience. And, so people that don't know what when I say the contab at FEU, um, I can give the I can give the structure of it. Um, last year there were a group of 100 people. We were sitting in a loungy type space. Um, we all had laptops, iPads, some sort of a technology in front of us because that was just the type of group that was there. Um, and a speaker would go up with a prepared talk um, that would start a conversation, and it would probably break it would break into question and answer for about 45 minutes of the hour that mm -hmm. the, the talk was happening. And, and it really, it was, it was speakers that were willing to turn over the control of their presentation so that the group engaged each other and learned from each other in a big group setting. Um, and, that, and that's one way that the, the, the SA Tech Austin this past year that happened was um, along the lines of groups splitting up and coming up with ideas on their own, completely facilitated by themselves with, with a little or minimal prompt, um, decided on by what the groups wanted to do. So. Lisa, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. And sorry, so this makes that this Canadian very happy. Um, the, the thing with, with unconferences and the thing with, with unsessions, and I've had the chance to do both. I went to SA Tech Boston um, to participate in my first unconference. I've also done unsessions around technology at NASPA um, with Eric Stoller, and I'm doing it this year. Um, and they're great. The opportunity for conversation and connection is fantastic. But I always have to acknowledge and I always have to remember that they still favor a certain learning style and a certain temperament more so than others. Um, just like conferences where you sit and watch a screen favor certain learning styles and certain temperaments more than others. And that doesn't make one better than the other. It just means that certain people are going to respond to those in a better way than others. Um, so I always have to be conscious that when Eric and I stand in front of the room and Eric makes the mistake of giving me Red Bull, that when I start talking and giving people information and getting really passionate about a topic, uh, it's still not peer-to-peer -peer learning if I'm just giving information. And it's still not peer-to-peer -peer learning if we're sitting in a room where Eric and I are on stage, as it were, and we're giving information to people and hoping to spark conversation from people sitting in rows of chairs. Um, the, the environment plays such an important role in a lot of this, where when I wrote a blog post about SA 
boss and I talked about structuring the unstructured and how fascinating that idea is to me. Even when, Mike, you talked about the confab and you said, let me give you the structure of the confab, um, my, my, I kind of went, structure of an unconference? Like it's, it's strange when you think about it that way, that we really need to structure the unstructured in a way that makes it accessible to as many people as possible. So extroverts like me will enjoy the conversation and connection. Here's a word, here's a topic, go talk. Some introverts, again, not to generalize all of them, will need time to think and reflect on their own. But what's difficult with that from an assessment lens is we can't see um, the connections being made and the reflections happening because it's happening internally and because it's happening on their own. So it's it's tough for me to, to outright love um, on sessions and unconferences as much as it is for me to outright advocate for um, larger conferences. I certainly love going to NASPA. I love going to caucus. Shout out to caucus, our Canadian national conference. Uh, there's lots of conversation that is sparked there and sometimes we need that space. We need someone um, on a stage or um, on a larger platform to give people something to talk about um, and then creating spaces for that conversation to happen. Do, do you see a way that these, <clears throat> we can combine the learning styles of both um, or multiple learning styles into the the, the things that the, the systems that are already being created out there by, by the individuals or does you know do you see the do you see the organizations out there um, kind of incorporating the un part of you know the unconferencing into the current conference structure and, and kind of doing hybrids yeah and, and that's what has started to do and caucus has been doing that as well well there'll be you know conversation and connection uh, type spaces just there are spaces for the more traditional stand on a stage and deliver a presentation uh, what we did at caucus this year was something called birds of a feather sessions where it was basically a small knowledge community so I facilitated um, a leadership um, conversation leadership development conversation on behalf of learn which is our leadership educators and resource network I'm just gonna plug all of the caucus Canadian stuff. <laughs> um, but we have our, we started to pilot knowledge communities much like NASPA and ACPA. Um, LEARN is the pilot, the first uh, knowledge community around leadership educators. And we created a session and a space where we had to have some structure to it. We have to give people something to talk about. We had to manage our time. We only had an hour. It couldn't be a free-flowing conversation in an hour. And we had some specific goals for what we wanted people to get out of it. Um, so in that space, as, as Joe was saying, which I absolutely agree with and which what, what resonates with me is giving some control away. Um, so giving the presenter an opportunity to give away some of the control they have over the session and to allow people to create it themselves. Um, so rather than trying to structure the session ahead of time, we're really looking at some emerging structure um, and having people co-create their learning experience, much like I try to do with my students. I can certainly come in and give you a PowerPoint presentation and tell you my thoughts on leadership, but I want you to be a part of co-creating that experience with me. Um, but again, that's terrifying for people who are used to more conference uh, style presentations where I have the clicker in my hand and I'm going to go through the slides at my own pace and I don't want you asking questions. It's been a long time researching this. So there, there's, there's room for both. Um, I think there really just needs to be first and foremost, it sounds simple, but it's not. There needs to be an acknowledgement that people learn and take in information in different ways. Um, I will totally put out my bias. I was recently certified as an MBTI practitioner, Myers-Briggs Temperament Inventory, so I use terms like extrovert and introvert a lot more now. Uh, but that course is really a chance for us to acknowledge that people do learn and, and teach in very different ways. Uh, and there's space for all of those, but there needs uh, to be a more conscious effort to do that. Do, do you guys have any suggestions for people that would want to present in that um, open forum type style? You know, tips that you know you can how to remove yourself and how to get engagement from the group form. Joe, it's your turn. <laughs> Practice. I mean, you could you could do an un un conference on campus. Like, it's not hard to organize these things. You could start, and Terry Bump gave me this idea uh, two years ago when I was at Nichols College of having these TED Talk lunches. Get a group of people together, invite them around the conference table, say, I'm going to show you a video, let's eat lunch and just talk about the video. And that started a little committee at, while I was at Nichols, and as far as I know, that committee's still going on, and they're creating new traditions and doing a lot of the little small changes behind the scenes on campus. And that's all it takes, is if you just practice having conversations with that small group, then sure enough, now you're on stage facilitating conversations with a larger group, and now you're hosting conferences and saying, here's what you can do and here's what's happening. Because it's really not hard. If you, if you think about it, 
Ed's amazing, but Ed's one guy who said, I have an idea. I know some people. Let's get together for a conversation. Dean Elmore is one guy with a lot of help from Kat, who's, who's in his office as well, saying, we have an idea. Let's make it happen. There's nothing stopping you from doing that on your campus, folks. You don't have to be huge. You don't have to be all, you know, have all these Twitter follows and everything or have a blog. You could say, hey, folks in my region, I'm going to have a conversation. Campus is nice enough. We're going to have this day, this meeting room's open. Why don't you all come here and let's have a talk about this? And don't put it under the bed. That's my concern with, with assuming uh, tying a name to it, whether it's ACPA or NASP or any other organization. Immediately, there's like this formality, like, oh, it's, it's, it's with that association, so I'm probably going to have to pay. I have to look a certain way. We're going to have these name tags. Do it as informal as possible. If you went to Comfab last year, Dean Elmore printed out, <laughs> it was literally like billboard name tags that asked you, what you're, what, you know, whatever he says, like, what, how do you like to groove? Or what, what do you listen to to get you inspired? Those little things you can do. There's no reason you can't. I think people get so afraid and so blown out of proportion, like, oh, my God, I don't think I can do that. Well, you know what? A year ago, I doubt Lisa thought, I don't know if I can do a TEDx. And a few weeks ago, she gave a TEDx. So it's, it's about empowerment of people realizing that they can have a great idea, but unless they're doing something with it, nothing happens. And if they take a risk, you're on a college campus. What greater place to fail, try, experiment, and try new things than where you're working? I mean, that's the whole, I mean, if we're going to be role models for our students and tell them that, oh, it's okay to fail. It's okay to try new things. Why aren't we doing it? Sorry, every that's time my rant. I finish speaking, I feel like I need to dust myself off. <laughs> 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 no, I absolutely agree with Joe, as, as, I, as I tend to from time to time. Um, and going back to uh, the TEDx, and you're absolutely correct, that I still doubt that I actually did it. I was saying earlier that the time on the stage is, is a black hole in my memory. I remember walking onto the stage. I remember leaving the stage. The time in the middle is a complete blur. So it's possible that it didn't happen. Thank goodness for the video. That's um, how I feel about the past 40 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, and, and to use terminology I used in the, in the talk that seemed to resonate with people, it's really about getting off our pedestals. It's about knocking them down and using that material that we've used to build these things up into things we never thought we could do and using that material to create paths, not just for us but for other people. And sometimes the paths lead to conversations. Sometimes they lead to other resources. Sometimes they lead in a completely new direction. Um, but you really have to be comfortable with wandering and you really have to be comfortable with being on um, the same level, so to speak, as everyone else. And people will always talk about that, whether it's the humble brag or just humble in general. Um, and that's the great dichotomy of pedestals. We keep climbing because we want to be up there, but we're terrified once we're there. Um, and we're terrified of making the climb to get up there. So you really have to stop thinking about it as, you know, um, Joe and Lisa have done this great thing. Even being on this show today, Joe and Lisa are talking about these great things, and Lisa's done TEDx, so what? Um, because really all I had was a bigger platform to share the same idea that you may have. That's all it is. My platform just reached a wider audience. That's all it is. Um, and you can create those smaller ripple effects on campus, just like Joe was saying. You can start a conversation with one person, just as I'm sure Ed's um, on sessions, on conference ideas started with one other person. Hey, what do you think? This might be a good idea. Cut to now we're doing, what is it, six or seven different unconferences throughout the year? So. One small step, if you will, one uh, movement away from climbing a pedestal to walking down a path will make a huge difference. But um, if you're reaching for something that you've distorted by putting on a pedestal, um, you're never going to reach it. So let's start with walking those paths. Wow. <laughs> awesome, guys. Um, and I want to give a disclaimer that we're not, we are, I don't think any of the three of us are against any um, current organizations that are out there. Um, we are, I, I think we've all found value in different organizations. We've, we've presented at them, we've used mm -hmm. them, we have gone to them, we've found connections from them. Um, I think in general, we, we are just posing questions that you know talk about what the future could be. Oh yeah, I mean, Instigating I, change. Yeah. <laughs> I work for one of them. Um, I work for Caucus, and there is certainly great value in it, and I'm not biased just because I work for them, but I'm also biased in the sense that, again, they create a wide platform for people to have these conversations and for those ideas to reach a large group of people in a short amount of time, which is exactly what Twitter is. Um, so just because some people tweet more just means that they have more things going out to a wider audience. But I've seen some people tweet one thing over one week, and that has sparked more conversation than anything mm -hmm. that I've posted all day. So... It's not about you know uh, quantity or frequency as much as it really is about quality and deep thought. 
Awesome. I'm going to move into one last kind of topic area, or one last topic area before we do some final questions. Um, and, and that's kind of going, I, I guess this kind of came up to me when I was thinking about this. I, it's kind of a, a mix of professionalism um, as you're going into these type, these type of unconference sessions and whatnot. And, you know, you're going to a conference and you're making your connections and you have a certain level of professionalism there. I think that kind of maintains, you know, through the unconference session, I think there's a request to open up a little bit more, um, to think outside the box, to not be afraid to say, you know, your innovative ideas. Um, I, and I, I guess with that, I wanted to also go into, um, this doesn't transition very well, but maybe can't do it. <laughs> but when I asked for question, when I asked for possible topic areas that Joe and Lisa wanted to talk about, um, Joe, actually Joe was asking for questions, and Joe replied to me, hey, bring up TEDx. So I made at least a talk about that. And the other area was LinkedIn, which has to do with professionalism. See how I transitioned there? Not so much. I'm wearing a Mr. Rogers sweater. So, <laughs> <laughs> Joe, how'd you want, you wanted to talk about LinkedIn. I, because I, it, you know, it, I love LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is one of the most underutilized social networks for our field. Now, there's other fields who, who absolutely rule LinkedIn and everything. And I feel the same way about Google+, Plus, but I haven't had a much chance to play with Google+, Plus as I have with LinkedIn, because not a lot of people are on Google+, Plus that I can find. So when it comes to LinkedIn, there is just... Twitter's great, like Lisa said, for starting conversation. It's very hard to have a constant conversation on Twitter, because you're limited to characters, which makes you be more pithy and, and, and or pithy. I don't know how to use that word. I know how to write it, but I don't know how to say it. So it makes you be very short. It makes you be very thoughtful of how can I get my point across in this in this length. But with LinkedIn, um, the, the reason I brought that up and the reason I've been touting it and blogging about it and everything is because I found it as a member of the, the uh, alumni board to be such a powerful tool to reach out to students and reconnect with students for these intentional conversations because when you re reach out either on Gchat or on Facebook, it, I mean, you could say happy birthday on Facebook to a thousand people in a day, it, they're not going to remember who you are, chances are, because it's just like everybody does, oh, happy birthday, or they'll like your status, okay, but what does that mean? Like, and I wrote about that, about being extraordinary, like, okay, you like the status, tell me what, how do you feel about that? Like, tell me more wh why you're liking it. Um, but when it comes to LinkedIn, when you're reaching out to somebody on LinkedIn, I just feel, instead of saying the, you know, I'd like to add you to my professional network. Okay, well, what does that mean? So what value are you bringing into my network? What value am I bringing into your network? What are you doing? What's exciting? And what I found from doing this for the past few months now is I could send an email to somebody and say, so what's going on? And it's going to be very short. I send an email to somebody on LinkedIn, and it's either because it catches them off guard or it gets them in the mindset that they're in LinkedIn, so they're, they're thinking professionally, quote, unquote, I guess you could say, but their responses on LinkedIn have been paragraphs, have been well thought out. You can actually feel in some cases the energy they get from doing their job or from chasing the dream that they're chasing, or whatever the case is. And I haven't seen that anywhere else. You don't get that on Facebook messages. You don't get that on Gmail. You, you don't get that in a lot of things, but I've been using that on, on LinkedIn, especially for students who, I think I mentioned in another blog post somewhere, was they're on the fringe. These are students that I recognize their name because they're a leader of an organization, not an organization I advised, not an organization I interacted with, but I know enough to recognize their name. They probably recognize my name from emails. So when I reach out to them and say, hey, how's it going? Just reaching out to see how things are going. I know we didn't connect much on campus, but I see you're doing amazing things now. What excites you? That started so many more conversations and showed me the value of LinkedIn as truly a networking tool. And I think it's, a, it's very much a social tool. But so many people only see LinkedIn as, oh, that's the place you go where you post your resume and then you look at when you need a job. And I'm seeing it more as... Twitter taught me the value of social media. LinkedIn is where I'm actually applying the concepts of creating valuable connections and creating a valuable network to help others. And it's been it's been fun. I mean, I'm going to write more about it and try and get more people on it. And I'll, I'll brag about LinkedIn till I lose my voice. If you want to talk LinkedIn with me any day, I will sit there and talk about LinkedIn. Because if you use it correctly, just like Twitter or any other tool, if you use it correctly, it's a heck of a lot of fun. And you can do a lot of very interesting things with it. And from acts of kindness to professional recommendations to endorsing people to connecting to getting new material to share. It's it's really, really cool. I agree. <laughs> um, we've had LinkedIn come up in a few of our tech on sessions at NASPA, and there's a couple things I always say, um, both to professionals and to the students that I've worked with when I do career services, um, anything around job hunting or networking. Um, networking is a, a really confronting term. Um, to a lot of professionals and to a lot of our students. And 
rightly so, many students are um, intimidated by it and frankly find it to be fake and inauthentic. And what's really interesting about it being fake and inauthentic is a lot of people will talk about marketing themselves and I've actually moved away from talking about marketing yourself because I don't think that person and product are synonymous. Um, so LinkedIn is really an opportunity for people to um, talk about themselves in a professional way but provide more clarity and more depth beyond here are the bullet points on my resume or here's my job title. So when someone asks you what you do it's not here's my job title because again those two are synonymous and that's one of my big pet peeves. When I ask you what you do I don't want you to tell me drive job title never do that because I will ask you again no really what do you do um, but one thing I always say about LinkedIn is it's not the professional Facebook um, it absolutely mm -hmm. is not and should not be used that way um, and Joe was alluding to this um, but one of the key distinctions between Facebook and LinkedIn is Facebook has privacy settings and we can talk about those privacy settings and how good they are later but the fact that people get so up in arms when the privacy settings are changed means that on Facebook as much as you broadcast and as much as you share fundamentally it's more private. There are only certain people you want to share with, there are only certain times that you want to share certain things um, and even though you may brag about having a certain number of friends realistically you want to keep certain things private and we always talk to our students about the dangers of Facebook. Don't post this because someone might mm -hmm. find it. Um, LinkedIn on the other hand, people put themselves on LinkedIn because they want to be connected with. They want people to see them and they want people to talk to them, which is so exciting and such an opportunity for networking, um, for starting conversations, because I can look at Joe's profile um, and know that he's on there because he wants to connect with people. And I can look at his profile and create a connection that's beyond, I kind of want to talk to you because I think you're kind of cool and you talk about LinkedIn all the time, maybe we should connect. It's I can look at your profile and say, this is what Joe's doing. He's also working in first year transitions. Hey, can you talk about this? Um, and so when I send a LinkedIn request, I don't just send, hey, I'd like to add you to my network. Like on Facebook, it's not just, um, hey, add you as a friend. It's a warmer connection. Hi, Joe, I looked at your profile. I see that you're doing this. I also do this. Here's a question I have. Um, and what I've started experimenting with now on the other end, I've gotten a few LinkedIn requests in the past week. And anytime I accept a connection, I immediately send a message to that connection asking them a question. Um, so they don't just sit. Um, on my profile, like I have a collection of Facebook friends. I don't have a collection of LinkedIn friends. I email everyone back a question. I looked at your profile and I saw this. Tell me your story. Um, I noticed that you're a graduate student. What are you doing? Oh, I noticed you, you're going to the University of Toronto. I also went to the University of Toronto. Anything to start a conversation. So it's not that I just have this Rolodex, this electronic Rolodex collecting dust, but I'm starting conversations. I'm reaching out to people. I'm talking to people. I'm learning about them. Um, and as cliche as it sounds, I'm learning about myself when I do that. Um, because as much as I ask them to tell me their story, they fire back. So what's your story? Good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I have to go back and talk to them about what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. Um, and the, I've already had some really great conversations. I've reconnected with people um, who work in the, the same area as me. This morning I started a conversation with someone who works at the same university that I do that I barely speak to who connected with me on LinkedIn and we just started a conversation this morning. Um, and they work in the same university, two buildings over, um, and we've barely spoken. So this is an opportunity to, to reach outside and to start those conversations because the hardest part really is to begin the conversations. People often talk about the hardest part is continuing it. Frankly, I think the hardest part is starting it. Um, and LinkedIn gives you information, loads of information to, um, to start those conversations and see where it takes you. Wow, you guys are almost converting me. Um, personally, yeah. I, <laughs> personally, I use I used LinkedIn, LinkedIn back when I started out. And I, I noticed about a month ago that I hadn't changed my job title in a year and a half. Um, <laughs> that it had changed. So I started doing a little updating. I keep getting these recommendation requests. So talk to me for both of you because you both seem to you know, love LinkedIn. Um, have you seen it work on the higher ed job field at all? Because one of the reasons I stepped away and didn't do, use it as much, um, it just didn't seem like it was that big in higher ed at the time that I had signed up. So you know, the past couple of years, has it, you know, I know that a lot more people in higher ed are doing it. Has it grown in the higher ed job market? Are you know, the new recommendations, are those meaningful? Do those work? Um, what do you think? It, it depends. I mean, meaningful is such a subjective contextual term um, to be difficult. It, it really is uh, subjective and it depends on the context, it depends on the situation. Um, what I often told my students was LinkedIn can become very quickly your professional home on the internet. Um, and it's an easy, accessible way to do that. So 
we do talk about portfolios. Lots of teacher candidates here create online portfolios. Um, it's almost the expectation now in the, in the job market for teachers anyway that they'll have some sort of online space because technology and the use of technology is really important to education for us. Um, but LinkedIn is a space where you can create your professional home. Um, it's a space where you can talk about your experiences in, more in depth, as I mentioned. And then more importantly, it's a space where you can share that with other people who are looking to do the same thing. Um, but you, you have to go beyond just being passive in reading recommendations, writing recommendations, updating your profile. Um, LinkedIn takes work, just like Twitter takes work, just like anything you do takes work if you want it to be meaningful. Um, whatever you put in is what you get out. So if I want to connect with other people, I have to do some of the connecting. I'm not going to wait for them to come to me. And if they do come to me, I have to start that conversation and ask for what I'm looking for, ask for what I want to talk about. Um, it's also a space where if an employer Googles you, and they do, and we talk about this all the time, um, but if they Google you, LinkedIn is a space where you can show not only what you do, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, but who you know. Um, and we talked about this a little bit in Unsession last year um, when we talked about Identity 2.0. Um, Eric and I talked about it's not just um, who you are, but who you know, um, and who knows you. Um, I know when I looked at LinkedIn profile uh, and LinkedIn connection requests, I don't just look at their profile, I look at who else they know. Um, oh, I have, they have Joe in common. Um, we know each other. Oh, this is someone who Joe recommended I should connect with. And it's not a comment on who they are as much as it's a comment on who they're connected with and who else they're having conversations with, which makes that connection a little bit easier and a little more meaningful. Um, but it's, it's important that... Um, when, when you are on LinkedIn and you are looking through profiles and you are connecting, again, it's all about quality over quantity. You don't need 50,000 LinkedIn connections. Um, you don't need to be in the top 5% most views of 12, which I still don't understand. I want to put it as a resume headline, but I, I don't feel that's going to be all that meaningful. Um, but it's, it's again, it's more about if I make a connection with one other person, I was having a conversation yesterday with a graduate student at our local um, Ontario Institute of Studies and Education, OISE. Um, he's an international student who had just started his master's program um, and wanted to know how I got into student affairs and we had a whole discussion about what that looks like and what it looks like in Canada and he was teaching me things about higher ed in other places and it was fascinating. Um, and instead of spreading myself thin and having that conversation with all of my LinkedIn connections, I chose to focus on him um, and learn from him and I hopefully he uh, learned something from me too. But it's it's becoming more important that we start those conversations because even if someone is a hiring manager, they know somebody who's a hiring manager or they have the ear of somebody who's a hiring manager or they know somebody who has an open door that's ready for you to walk through. Um, so every connection really is an opportunity and it's up to you to take advantage of it. And when I said, I'm sorry, when I said recommendations, I looked it up, I made a mistake. I more meant um, a whole new endorsement system mm -hmm. too as well. So <laughs> It's all you. Me? Yeah. After all that? Let's see. <laughs> what was the original question? <laughs> uh, do you see do you see LinkedIn working on the, the higher ed professional on the, jobs for the job search scale? Right, right. So here here's why I think the problem is I don't think people are, are realizing the value of LinkedIn. I think a few are and those people go out and preach about it and, and talk about how it's great. Uh, in my last search, I did use it heavily, not so much for contacting um, Connections. I use Twitter a lot because my Twitter network at that point was was unbelievable with some of the support I was able to get from folks from all over. Um, but what I used LinkedIn for was, okay, who's in this position now? Who works there and who works there that knows somebody? So I was really using LinkedIn as a filter. I'd find out who knows who and then I'd go to Twitter and DM folks and be like, hey, just wondering if you know, you're connected to this person. How do you happen to know? And the thing is with that, and this is another post that's in my head, is the value of LinkedIn, you have to be aware of who you're connecting with because, yes, I would, you know, I, I want to connect with Terry Bump because Terry Bump's all over the place and she knows everybody and she's a f fantastic professional. But then when a student comes and friends me or, or wants to connect with me and I'm questioning why, why would I want to be in a student's network, you have to look both ways. Why would Terry Bump want to connect with me when I'm clearly I'm trying to connect with her because in the equation, it seems like she, she's a very valuable connection to have. So, and she, you know, when you're in that stance, especially with students now, is you have to look at yourself as, okay, I know the connections I value. Am I going to be one of those valued connections for the student? They may not bring anything to the table for me, but chances are I'm going to be something to bring to the table for them. Um, 
and that I think is something we all need to keep in check and, and, and realize that if you're just going down the list and saying accept, 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 or if you're going down the list and scrutinizing, I don't want to be connected to this person, I don't want to be connected to that person, almost think of the fact of, well, even send them back and you can reply without confirming the connection. Say, and I often do this, I'll say, hey, I don't recognize your face or name, what brought you to my profile, how can I help you out? And that has started some amazing conversations of what people found me and everything. Um, so I think when it comes to LinkedIn and when it comes to job searches, a lot of people use it to see who's there. And if they're heavy on Twitter, they're going to see who, who are their Twitter followers or who they follow on Twitter might be able to hook them up with. I would hope as you know, the, this digital identity and everything else continues to take off that more folks are looking at their LinkedIn. So they're not going to the LinkedIn profile a year later, Mike, and saying, oh, that's not my job anymore. Um, because it's up there on the, on the Google ranking is when you Google yourself, chances are LinkedIn's going to be on that first page just because it's your name. Um, and I think like Lisa said, that it opens up for so much more communication because you're putting so much out there, which clearly are your interests. And when Mike, when you said the endorsements, a lot of people are saying, oh, the endorsements aren't worth anything. You're just clicking. It's like a like. But the endorsements for me are interesting because I'm not going to put much value in the fact that, okay, 30 people have endorsed you about storytelling. What that tells me is storytelling is going to be a point of conversation to have with you because clearly other people think that you love talking about it or love doing it. Um, so in that sense, it, it's great when it comes to job searching. I think you really got to be pay attention to the groups. There's so many conversations happening in the LinkedIn groups. I think LinkedIn's next you know, ad or whatever the case may be, their next effort needs to be bringing attention to the groups because those are very, very active. You think the SHAT hashtag is busy? Look at some of the higher ed groups that are having conversations around technology, about the state of the union, about everything else. Conversations are happening. There's an active group there. It's just not critical mass yet, so people aren't paying much attention to it. Wow. Thank you for dropping knowledge on us. You guys rock. <laughs> Mike's going to go um, LinkedIn profile. I am going, I, within the next week, I'm going to change my LinkedIn profile. We're in housing, we're in housing selection here, so I, I need to focus on that. But I will go on and change the LinkedIn, LinkedIn profile, and then I'm going to connect with the two of you. Yeah. And we'll email I'm not already connected. <laughs> um, the, I'm going to drop two final questions. Hopefully they'll be quick. Um, first question. In the event of the zombie apocalypse, when the power goes down, what's going to be the tech tool you miss the most? <laughs> I love how you hope that it's going to be a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, in the event of a zombie apocalypse, what tech tool would I miss the most? I guess the internet is, is a, a cop-out answer. Um, to be honest, I actually don't use a lot of tech tools. Um, I still have a pen and a notepad sitting next to me. Um, to me, tech is a tool that will allow me to do something that I already do better and or differently. So when it's things like communication, when it's things like conversation, when it's things like connection, um, any sort of tool that allows me to do that better or uh, to consume knowledge and to share knowledge and to teach knowledge, that's something that I'll use. And, and less is more, again, for me, so a huge one for me, um, any sort of tool that allows me to catalog and organize thoughts um, from conversations. I use Evernote, for example, things like that that'll allow me to catalog and organize. So in the event of a zombie apocalypse, why I haven't cataloged and organized my escape plan, that's probably going to be an issue. Um, so if I lost Evernote and didn't have zombie apocalypse survival plan one one and accessible, um, we'd be in trouble. <laughs> I'd say Twitter, just because for the hilarity. I mean, look what happened when the Super Bowl, when the power <laughs> went out. I mean, you had some of the funniest stand-up comedians right off the bat who probably never aren't comedians at all. But some of the comments, in it, I mean, it's it's entertaining. I'm sorry I missed the State of the Union because I'm sure some of the commentary happening there was probably just all over the place. In some Hold on, let me grab my Poland Springs bottle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hold on, I'm... I'm <laughs> All right. um, I, yeah, I definitely miss Twitter just for that, the commentary of everyday life that's out there. Okay. Awesome. Um, the second question I'm going to throw out, um, we had kind of dubbed this essay Fit Month. Um, we, did a, we did a show last week. Um, is there anything you're doing in February to love yourself in particular? <laughs> Why is it taking us so long? But that's a bad sign. What? Um, that we're taking so long to come up with an answer for that. Oh, no, mine, mine, um, I've been eating a lot healthier, you know, and, and cutting down on the junk and not having junk in the house. Um, I did try to start Insanity, but <laughs> after day three, I went to go get a glass of water. My knee gave out. 
Not even during the exercises. So I'm trying to get back up on that horse and start going because I have this thing, you know, this whole big ceremony with Robin Kaplan in a few months where I should probably be in a little bit better shape because I'm going to be dancing all night. Um, so, yeah, just trying to do daily exercises. I think uh, there was a group on Twitter this morning talking about power Lent and doing like a uh, crazy thing for the next 40 days. I'm just going to try and do some kind of exercise every day, at least a bare minimum, and hope that works for the best. I think it was called Extreme Lent, which made Extreme me, Lent. Which yeah. I was picturing an announcer voice, confetti cannons, and and sound effects and pyrotechnics. Um, Dis disclaimer: SA Live is a non-denominational <laughs> show. <laughs> but we all love sound effects, don't we, Mike? We do. <laughs> um, I, I <laughs> God, of all the ones you do. Uh, Frankly, I'm in, I'm, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> We knew he was going to pull that one out. I, know, I, I had to. I'm trying to get back into into a regular fitness routine. Um, I've been hitting the gym pretty hard as best I can. Um, I also have knee problems, but luckily it hasn't occurred when I'm reaching for a glass of water yet, but I'm sure it'll happen if I keep this exercise regime up. Um, I'm training for a couple of, of races. For those of you who follow my blog or follow me on Twitter, um, you saw that in November I ran my first 5K, and I guess the endorphins really kicked in, and I got a little addicted to it. So I'm registered for three more races this year, um, an 8K, uh, a 5K, and a 10K, and hoping to also add, as my 30 before 30 list says, um, a half marathon and a full marathon to that, because not. Um, so I'm still training uh, and still making time to train, not just for the physical benefits, but it's a great way to um, reflect on the day and to let out some of that negative or discombobulated energy, which you can certainly see. I'm usually very quiet and subdued, so I need that exercise to really pump me up. Um, but it's a space where I can um, productively use some of that misplaced energy. So I'm hoping to continue doing that to, to allow myself some space to actively honey. And for someone not at the 5K or insanity level, I just downloaded the 100 Push Ups app on my iPhone. <laughs> yeah, I can try to do that. That's cool. um, all right. Well, Joe, Lisa, thank you so much. Um, thank you to everybody that's been watching. Um, we have an uh, exciting rest of the month, I believe. We're still trying to hammer a couple things down, but to give you a preview, tomorrow at the BU Confab, um, Ed is not only presenting, but me and him are going to try to grab a couple people. Maybe do some live streaming video at the least. Do some recorded video that we can post to um, get you know get some info out there. I think you guys are really gonna like the content. Um, if you follow the normal higher ed um, hashtags, SA chat, all that, you'll probably see a confab hashtag put out tomorrow morning. I highly suggest following that. It got pretty mm -hmm. entertaining last year. Um, mm -hmm. There was a lot of a lot of knowledge dropped, a lot of entertainment to be had. So um, follow along. It's a hundred um, people in a room, and most of them are on Twitter along with the program so follow that um, next week and the week after I know that at some point in there Ed is trying to secure another show that's going to talk about um, career movement going into conference mm. season so some prep with you trying to get you ready as you're going into ACPA NASPA the placement conferences um, getting you thinking about that um, I know going into the end of the month he is also trying to secure um, some shows with ACPA and NERSA as they go into the ACPA conference oh yeah, um, yeah. So look forward to that. We'll be posting more as we come. Um, otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you, Joe and Lisa. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share? Let's kind of throw it out there. How, how Do a final question, Lisa. Do a final question. Oh, stop it. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know what Joe was alluding to, um, on the SA chat, what we've been trying to do um, is not just do a final thought, but do a final question, which was really my push to get people thinking and talking and learning and teaching beyond um, the SA chat topic. As, it's, as you've noticed, there's a lot to cover in one hour, but one hour is also a really short amount of time. Um, so I, I, it's, not a, it's not really a cop-out, but it's a question that I started asking at TEDx, and I'm hoping more people will start answering for me. Um, how have you dared to teach today? I'm curious. Um, it's something I asked at the TEDx conference at the end of my talk. Um, I got a few interesting responses from the attendees there. Um, but I'll put it out there. How have you dared to teach today? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, you can watch my talk, shameless plug. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm looking for in that talk. But I'm curious, how have you dared to teach today? Joe, you have to ask a question now. You made it. Uh, yeah, I know. I, and it's easy because it's one that uh, Lisa helped me form the other day, filling out some stuff, is when you're, when you're looking at an idea and you're looking at what somebody else is doing, I want you to seriously sit down and ask yourself, why not me?
I'll throw out what color socks you're wearing today. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. It's been great. I'm going to play you out with um, a little tune that I have to in honor of our guest. It's one of our guests. Have a great week. <laughs>